Hi Laria, welcome to this dialogue uh, with Stewardship Asia Center and thanks for giving us the opportunity to have this short conversation with you. Why don't we kick off this conversation by asking you to tell uh, tell us more about who you are and what you do. Thank you so much first of all for having me, it's an honor. Um, uh, so I'm Ilaria, I currently am the chairperson of Tech for Good Institute, which is a nonprofit think tank founded by Grab two years ago. Um, and I'm also a group advisor for Grab. My previous life was with Goldman Sachs, um, based in New York, but focusing on Asia equities. And later on, I was a private investor and a public speaker. Uh, aside from my role currently with Tech for Good Institute and Grab, I also serve on a few boards that are consist of humanitarian organizations, education, tech, venture capital, uh, real estate, and also women empowerment initiatives. I want to start the dialogue by asking you, uh, I know that Grab uh, is embracing uh, tech for good for what they are doing in ASEAN. So I would love to understand how the company is harnessing technology and innovation to drive this agenda. One of the things that moved me about the co-founders was I remember Tan Hui Ling mentioned when he decided to, she decided to start the company with Anthony, that at that time, Malaysia safety was a big problem. So as a woman coming back home late from work, she actually had to call her mom like a human GPS and update her wherever she was in order to make sure the driver knows she's, they're being tracked. Um, and hence, at that time, with the Uber model, they want to bring it to Malaysia to ensure and solve the safety issues, especially for women. And that's how it birthed um, the idea 11 years ago of starting with safety and then, of course, solving for convenience. Um, but later on, uh, moving on to economic empowerment, which really today is the core of Grab's mission in all of its um, sectors, whether it's in delivery and fintech or in um, mobility. So in economic empowerment comes in many ways, but I think some of the examples I really love the most is some of the earliest um, leaders of Grab, when they are trying to help uh, driver partners sign on board, realize that a lot of people in Southeast Asia actually do not have bank accounts. They store cash under their beds. They're invisible to the economy, which means they don't benefit from what you and I can get from loans from the bank, having credits, all of the above. So actually starting to open bank accounts for drivers is how it all started to realize that financial inclusion is a big problem and that they need to help solve that for merchant and driver partners that end up working with Grab. And that's how later on um, Grab Financial Group was birthed because it's there to extend loans, extend uh, credit proxy because now now, because of uh, digital footprint, people's work, how they get orders completed, and how they successfully uh, earn money is now being documented online. And so then we can extend micro loans to them and they can upgrade their livelihood. So many of the driver partners can afford to buy a motorcycle, for example, maybe start a chicken farm. Um, many of the SMEs are now able to upgrade their livelihood because of financial inclusion that comes from the core of economic empowerment through the services that Grab can offer through the platform. So I would say these are core, some examples um, just to brush the surface, but but economic empowerment and inclusion um, through these uh, services is really at the core of Grab's DNA to create social impact for Southeast Asia. No, thanks for setting the context. And I love the idea of uh, using technology for economic empowerment and inclusion. Talk a little bit about uh, how does Grab uh, keep pace in terms of ever-changing technology? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's a technology initiative. And uh, you know, so how do you how do you constantly keep innovating internally? Yeah, I mean, this is all new to all of us, isn't it? Every day, something new is about to rock our world and change our habits. Um, so, for example, helping driver partners, merchant partners come online is not enough. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to give your grandmother a cell phone. That's not enough. You have to actually provide digital literacy and ensure there's safe guardrails uh, governing the use to help people to actually have their lives improve. So, for example, some of our food delivery partners, merchants, after you help them come online, we are now offering data insights to help them have better insights into customer behavior so that they can improve their offerings, inventory management, and hence their business and bottom line can be improved. That's on the merchant side. Um, we believe in talent in Southeast Asia and of course the scene was more immature a decade ago and so Grab has actually built eight R&D centers mm -hmm. just to help further the talent and breed the talent here in Southeast Asia, homegrown talent, so that um, the tech scene doesn't have to keep importing from other countries, right? Um, and another example would be actually hyper-local uh, location-based services. So actually Grab has their own maps. We call it Grab Maps and and it's because, um, I don't know if everyone has been to 
Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, there are a lot of back alleys, there are small houses. Every mall has like eight entrances. So you can actually go crazy just trying to tell the driver where you are, especially if you have also language barriers, which happens in a region with multiple languages here. So we actually develop our own in-house grab maps in order to have a hyper-localized approach to help minimize and increase, uh, minimize time lost, but also increased productivity for drivers and of course for customers. So those are just some examples where it, it takes something to start something, but you also have to keep improving it to make sure that you're benefiting your stakeholders in the maximum way possible. So I use Grab twice a day. Thank I never you. knew what goes behind me spending like 30 seconds to use the app. So thanks for sharing. Uh, and talk a little, um, a little more about the purpose that uh, the Institute furthers for Grab, for instance. So what are you trying to accomplish and how do you accomplish this social impact, if you will? Sure. So Tech for Good Institute was birthed um, right around the time when Grab went IPO in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time during COVID, I think uh, I remember just with our teammates, we're trying to uh, launch thought leadership, just trying to engage the community because people are so interested in what the digital economy is doing to Southeast Asia, but there are not a lot of platforms for people to learn, talk, and do something about it. So um, in 2021, end of the year, we launched Tech for Good Institute. Our mission really is to bring together the public and private sectors in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. laser focus on thinking about how to use tech to nation build, hence the name Tech for Good Institute. Mm -hmm. um, we do it through content, through research. We have our own in-house research. We also collaborate with thought leaders, industry experts to create and curate pieces that are accessible online for everybody. We also are a convening platform where we host in-house um, multiple country roundtables around Southeast Asia to engage policy influencers, policy makers, industry people and businesses, and the public, because everybody has a part in the digital economy. And most importantly is um, as things are unraveling and we're just learning about difficult issues, for example, you know, welfare gig workers, how does platform work uh, benefit or not benefit people? Um, are there, what happens when fraud happens and, and how do we improve the digital literacy? We need to engage everyone in the ecosystem. It cannot be in a silo. So the mission of mm -hmm. Tech for Good really is to be that platform uh, for everyone to learn and hopefully translate into action and results to nation build in Southeast Asia. And talk a little bit more about these interdependencies because we understand from a steward leadership standpoint, it's critical that uh, these interdependencies get to the next level. So talk a little bit about how, how, how do you harness the power of uh, ecosystem or, or, or a few more examples perhaps? I mean, in many ways, when I mentioned, right, normally policymakers and influencers are not in regular dialogue with the public. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, I think we neglect the public. I think the outrage globally about um, concerns and uncertainties about tech sector is because the public feels like they are not part of the process of deciding what gets offered, what gets done, what's even going on. And a big part of it is actually digital literacy. So on the operating company side, Grab actually offers a lot of digital literacy access, scholarships, um, programs. We partner with Microsoft, for example, to offer courses to help driver partners understand the digital landscape. We hosted uh, digital workshops for the elderly, I remember during COVID, to teach the elderly how to use, you know, have a digital clinic. Um, we help hawker centers that are mm -hmm. made up of a lot of kind of older generation um, merchants and help them go digital to sell and batch their goods so they can make money during COVID. So I think a big part of just how you further and take the extra mile is to make sure that no one is just superficially trying to connect. Um, you're actually trying to solve what is preventing people from deep understanding and deep collaboration. Mm -hmm. You provide the resources, easy, accessible, resources for people to actually um, be on the same page. Um, and talking is great. Um, you know, the convening of people is powerful, especially in the age of AI threatening us um, as we are worried because you cannot replace human interaction relationships. Mm. But on top of that, after talking, what do we do? Does it translate into action? Do action translate into results? And do the results serve all stakeholders from all socioeconomic classes? That's something that I think at Grab, at the Institute, uh, we think a lot about. And that's what keeps the leaders up at night, I think, is like, you know, you're creating a great commercial product, but how does it change the lives of people here who need to be changed? 90% um, of Southeast Asia is operated by SMEs, by mm. these tiny, mer you know, tiny businesses, small merchants, um, and they make up two thirds of the working population. Their health 
defines the future of Southeast Asia's health. So we are here really to serve them as well as, of course, everybody else who uses the service. I know, of course, and, and would love to talk about you as a leader, finally, you know. Uh, who's the person behind the chair of Tech for Good Institute? I, I was looking at your background and I understand you've spent a few years working in the Wall Street, you sit on a bunch of boards, uh, you've attended culinary school, if I'm not wrong. So uh, talk a little about what motivates you, because when I think about Wall Street and I think about the kind of work you're doing now, in my mind there is a strong polarity. So uh, tell me, how does all of this impact your values, your leadership style? Mm, um, well, I'm just a bit of a mutt, really. I think um, my journey has been, nothing was planned. There was no crystal ball. When I left Goldman Sachs um, in the mid-2011, 2012 period after mm -hmm. the financial crisis, I just wanted to enrich myself as a person, which mm -hmm. led me to do culinary school, to volunteer with the homeless and get on the road with nonprofits, and later on went into thought leadership private investments and um, meeting and knowing uh, Grab's founder um, was a great blessing to me because um, he gave me a chance to learn about technology and try to contribute. Um, I started off in the corporate finance area, but you know, very soon realized that actually public affairs and thought leadership is really my passion. <laughs> um, and everything I do, whether it's humanitarian boards or private investments or right now, you know, with Tech for Good Institute, they all have the same theme, is to bridge the East and West and also to unite um, humanitarian and business sectors to do good for the world. And it's not because I'm so brilliant and that I wanna, you know, and, and I'm so noble, but because I think doing good inherently fulfills us as human beings. Um, it brings us joy, it brings us meaning in life. And if we can do this, and we're also privileged, frankly, to be sitting here, right? To be discussing things, to be educated, to, you know, have a shelter and food. Um, for people who are not having that at this moment, if we can even make a dent, um, that is very fulfilling. So I think being able to unite these sectors, these for-profits and non-profits, and most importantly, to take different people out of their echo chambers and um, put people together in a room, whether it is different religion, different socioeconomic background, or from different countries now, which the world is so polarized, mm -hmm. that gives me huge satisfaction. So I always believe, business values-wise, um, we need to be one in a million, not one in five. So I have this thing called denominator theory, where you know, I want to be so unique and so quirky that no one can replace me. So I want to have as many experiences in life as I can to make me this unique person. And what, in terms of values, what I find um, aligned with leaders like Grab and Tech for Good Institute is I believe integrity and wanting something better for mankind is really the highest level of uniting people who are trying to do business well as well. So I am very blessed to be able to meet co-journeyers with a lot mm. of my colleagues and to be able to do what I do today and to be able to sit here with you today to discuss these issues. And, and, and you know, one final question I have for you is, uh, what about your leadership style? When you take on other roles now that you've been through this experience, you understand the reality of, uh, you know, uh, social inequality, if you will, and so on. How does that rub off on your leadership style when you are in other board positions or other leadership positions? Yeah. Um, my style is always very forthright, um, but very authentic. So I'll give you an example. Last, I just flew in from San Francisco two days ago. I had virtual board meetings with one of my humanitarian organizations with a group of um, elderly British men who are based in the UK. And I was Zooming with them while I was in my bathrobe because I was changing my 16-month-old diaper while Zooming with them to define the succession plan for the next generation of the organization. Um, I am unapologetic about how I look 6 a.m. in the morning, what I'm doing because I'm also a mother, but at the same time I give them my all when I'm with them um, and when I'm giving advice as a board director and when I'm, that I'm intentionally listening to them. I think being able to uh, very much embrace who we are and the vulnerability of it is an important part of being a leader, whether it's being a woman or a man, right? To be able to um, show all facets of your life mm -hmm. in a way that's confident uh, so that we are also able to get constructive feedback, constructive criticisms from people around us um, so that we also have credibility to lead. I think that um, that's the way I lead as, anyways. And I, I, I love that people actually embrace that part of me. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so, Ilaria, first of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, engaging in the dialogue. Love the stories, love the aspect of vulnerability in the stories that you shared. 
So uh, thanks for this opportunity to interview you. Thank you. Thank you.